Greetings and good afternoon from UTM Malaysia. To all our respectable viewers, I'm Chan from School of Computing, Faculty of Engineering, Techno University Technology Malaysia. Today, we are very fortunate and honored to have Professor Nazar Zaki all the way from United Arab Emirates University, UAE, as our distinguished uh, speaker today in our 82nd Distinguished Lecture Series. For your information, Professor Nazazaki received his PhD from UTM and has several research collaboration with UTM in machine learning and bioinformatics related work. Today, we are glad to have him again with us uh, for a very, very interesting lecture entitled The Future of Data Analytics Post-COVID-19 Pandemic. So without further ado, I would like to pass to our faculty dean, Professor Dato Rafiq, to brief you a bit about our distinguished speaker today. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Chan Wang Ho. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to all of you. Welcome to our 82nd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I'm the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Nazar Zaki from United Arab Emirates University. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Dr. Nazar Zaki is a professor of computer science, specifically machine learning, a proud graduate of the UTM PhD program and a recipient of the Dean's recognition for his valuable PhD work in 2004. He served as a chair, Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering, United Arab Emirates for almost 10 years, introducing new academic programs and contributed significantly to the establishment and success of the department. Dr. Zaki is a founder and the director of the Big Data Analytics Center with a mission to ingrain a sustained impact through groundbreaking data analytics research and services. Dr. Zaki's research interest is in the fields of data mining, machine learning, and bioinformatics. He mainly focuses on developing intelligent algorithms to solve problems in specific domains such as biology, healthcare, business, and social networks. He published more than 120 scientific results in reputable journals and conferences. He received several scholarship awards, such as the College Recognition Award for Excellence in Scholarship in 2007, 2012, and 2016. Best Paper Award in Leading Conferences, such as ACM Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference in 2011, Chancellor's Annotation Award in Technology in 2015. Dr. Zaki is also a frequent recipient of Certificates of Achievement for publishing in top journals and bringing recognition to the UAEU. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Nazar Zaki from United Arab Emirates University on the future of data analytics post-COVID-19 pandemic. Professor Nazar Zaki, over to you. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Rafiq. Thank you, Dr. Chan, uh, for arranging this. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to reconnect with the UTM. It's, uh, it has a special place in my heart, of course. And, uh, uh, you know, we need always to get back and collaborate. So um, my talk today uh, basically will be uh, about uh, uh, big data analytics in general and what we do after COVID-19. Let me uh, just upload my um, uh, slides. Uh, oops, uh, I think uh, Prof. Zaki mistakenly leave the studio. Uh, just wait for a while. Ah, okay.
All right. Uh, is the uh, slide clear now? Yes, Prof. We can see the slide. All right. So uh, we shall start. So um, the the title of the talk, as I mentioned, is Future of Data Analytics uh, Post COVID-19. And uh, the purpose of this talk is uh, not to talk much about COVID-19 itself, but uh, uh, we use COVID-19 here as, uh, as a checkpoint to what we do so far in terms of data analytics, because you know, uh, we, and, and by we, I mean the people in machine learning and, and, and AI and big data analytics, uh, we feel there are a lot of uh, improvement that has to be done in the, in, the, in, in the way we do data analytics today. Uh, and well, for all of us, that's, these kind of changes were not uh, uh, must or were not urgent. That's why we keep delaying it. And at the same time, uh, we depend on, on work coming from uh, uh, professors and research centers to provide us with new uh, algorithm and improvement in what we do. But after COVID-19, everything changed. And uh, we started to see that, you know, we are, we're shortage of, of, uh, of the way we do data analytics. We cannot help in, in the pandemic. And that's why we need to go to the next step. So in this uh, talk, I'll be talking about what we do today, what weaknesses we have, and what we could do the next five years after the COVID-19 is over. So some of the directions I will, uh, I will mention has already started, and some uh, require still a lot of work. So um, I'll, I'm not going to talk much about how important uh, the data is today, because we have entered the big data analytics uh, era uh, and data intensive computing and we all know data now is a new oil it's a new oil because it brings uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know it improves our economy it improves our lifestyle and we need it in order to do better decisions so not only that but the market of uh, of data analytics is increasing every year for example in in 2015 which is you know, five years ago, it, it, it was $22.6 billion. So it's expected to reach something like $57 plus uh, million in 2020. And that kind of, you know, uh, numbering keep you increasing. That's why it's quite important to invest uh, in this kind of line. So we have been doing, you know, at least descriptive analytics uh, for, for a very long time. Um, and... Until today, most of the companies, our organizations, and even universities, they rely on descriptive analytics, uh, descriptive models, in order to see what happened uh, in, in, in their workflow. For example, uh, in university, we want to see, for example, a student success rate or a student attrition. Uh, uh, in health, they want to see how many cases, for example, of COVID-19 today and where they are and what's the correlation between factors could uh, actually uh, contribute to the increment uh, uh, level of the, of the disease uh, spread. So not only that, but we moved further more by doing some uh, diagnostic uh, uh, modeling as well. And, uh, for example, softwares like uh, uh, Power BI, Tableau, you can still provide you with the ability to go and drill on the data to see some of the insights. Uh, you can slice some of the data to see uh, a reflection of certain parameters. You can zoom in and see uh, uh, what's happening and why we're, are we getting this kind of results. But for the last uh, five or seven years, everyone was talking about predictive analytics because it adds more value for us to see what will happen next. And, and that's our goal. We have to be prepared. Uh, not only that, now people started to look at prescriptive, uh, prescriptive analytics. We want to see what we do in case of, you know, uh, let's say we want to predict a certain uh, uh, decision or we want to go... Uh, I'll give you an example. In academia, we want to see how many students we're going to, uh, for example, get the next year or how many employees we can, uh, we can uh, hire, high-quality faculty members, for example. So you can get something like, okay, I want to see, to minimize my risk, whether a certain faculty will be successful if it's hired or not. That's predictive analytics. But if you want to go further to see, okay, if it's not successful straight, or uh, uh, let's say 
maybe the environment may be not the right uh, position for, for a certain faculty member. What do we do about it? So the action taken uh, is, is another uh, uh, area that researchers are, are, are doing now because uh, we know that predictive analytics can give us what will happen, but we, know, we need to know more about what action to take. And I'll elaborate more in this because I'll be focusing more in predictive analytics here. So let's go deeper on, on what we do in, in analytics uh, architecture today. So if you go today uh, to any of the uh, company and you say, okay, I would like to turn my, uh, uh, my uh, work on, uh, in my university or in my organization or in my company uh, to data-driven decision-making. I want to move to the digital world and, and, and make uh, uh, you know, instant and good decisions based on data. Exactly, you will receive something like this, the architecture. And this architecture has more of uh, what we already know. You know, the big pieces, for example, is the data source, where we get the data from, and uh, the data lake, because uh, when you move into, you know, the digital era, basically you have data from all over the place, from different sources in different form. What you need to do is just to dump it in a data lake, and from that data lake, then you create your data lake house, uh, data warehouse, where you can actually have more clean data for decision making. So you could do better analytics if you have a uh, better uh, data warehouse. Not only this, but you can even inject a little bit of, of uh, uh, AI in it in order to improve the, uh, the uh, predictivity and the decision making. So these are the main pieces that must be in any uh, architecture today in order to be successful. But if you look at this architecture and after COVID-19, the whole thing changed because we realize there are a lot of pieces here don't, do not exist and we need to work on it before we can say that we have really good architecture or flow or pipeline for data analytics. And I remember when uh, the uh, big data, uh, the uh, COVID-19, first of all, uh, hit um, hit us hard and here in the university, in UAE University, we started straight away to assemble researchers. I was one of them who uh, come from, uh, uh, you know, AI background. They are uh, uh, physicians, they were biologists and, and people from modeling and mathematics. We came together uh, to solve or at least to uh, address the problem. And we soon realized that, you know, especially from my side, there's nothing I can do much because we do not have data. Or if we have data, the data is somehow lying in hospitals and the access to, to it is quite difficult. So what should we do And in order to contribute to this disaster? And, and there are a lot of problems here. I will mention it. I will take time uh, to talk much about the, uh, the, the weaknesses we have. And I'll summarize the whole thing in what we could do to address them. Let's take them piece by piece. If we talk about data, you know, people uh, and researchers complain a lot uh, about data integration, pre-processing and things like that. But this is, an, for me, it's time consuming, but it's easy and doable problems uh, and, and easy to address. It's, a, it's As long as you have the data, you can always come up with a better way of integrating it. So the problem is we have today we don't have enough data when it when it's really needed. You know, uh, we started to work on, on machine learning with some benchmark data and we are happy with, with what we achieved, but because we have data or sample data to work on. But if we have something like COVID-19 come all over sudden and now you need to do something with it, you realize that you don't have any. And if we have uh, data, we have access problems. Where are we? How can we access this problem, the, uh, this data? There are a lot of ethical and legal issues and privacy issues that to, has to be taken care of. The quality of the data is another thing. It's another problem because even if you get the data, they dump to you something could be rele relevant or not. Something could be accurate or not. Then we realize also govern, gov data governance is a, big, it's a big problem because five years ago or 10 years ago, people talking about data all the time. And then they moved to, you know, five years ago talking about models. Ah, okay, so now we come up with, with machine learning models that could actually do a lot of predictions. And uh, you see, 
uh, you visualize the results and we feel happy about it. But later, when we actually go to real problem, we realize that the process is a problem now. And that's why I've seen many companies now come uh, in, the, uh, in the IT field just dealing with processes, you know, because the, the core business, because uh, we realize that in order to access data, you need to have kind of a process that we don't have. You know, even uh, uh, government, hospitals, whatever, they would love to share their data and, and to get insight from it. But they don't know how. And if you run in, in approval levels, then it will take forever because the process is, is unclear. And when this data collected, is collected in a way that we did not obtain the right consensus and, and, and approvals from, from data owners and things like that. And now we have to dig back and, and enhance that process. This is the main uh, problem in, in data today. So, uh, and that's why I mask, if you notice, the data resources and data processing for now. So, from that architecture, those parts still have a problem to be addressed. Second is AI and predictive modeling issues. Number one uh, problem that I'm sure if you work in, uh, in machine learning, you agree with me, that traditional techniques are not flexible enough. How many problems you try uh, uh, to work on and you reach a level of accuracy that cannot be improved further or cannot be even applicable to a certain problem? And another thing is sometimes you can actually do that, but you have a limitation of the computational resources to handle it. We're talking about, uh, you know, ensemble uh, learning. We're talking about uh, deep learning where computational resources is, uh, should be really uh, enough. Another important thing, which is the, uh, the model deployment. In academia, uh, and I'm speaking of, you know, from myself or from my experience, we develop many solutions. We, we run a lot of machine learning work. We publish paper and that's ended there. So, uh, Government and industry, they expected more. They want to use this kind of, uh, of models and they want to test it in their own uh, you know, data and they want to make use of it. So we often, both of us, we don't speak the same language. We, we, yes, I have the model. I don't care about the next step because my KPI as a faculty member is to publish the paper and, and get recognition. Uh, not necessary to go farther down the road. So that's why there is a mismatch. And, and not only as faculty members, but you look at most of the platform already developed. You notice that it's developed that you can actually use machine learning models, but very few of them give you the flexibility that you can actually automatically deploy your, your, uh, your model and make it usable. For example, Microsoft Azure, uh, uh, Watson, uh, in, uh, IBM Watson does that. You, by simple click, you can straight away make your model deployed and, and ready. And not only this, but um, uh, also uh, recently, um, which is very important uh, for, for, for uh, data scientist researchers, uh, Python uh, came up with so many ways of deploying uh, models, and that would be very helpful for us. Another thing is uh, uh, the model interpretation, because most of the industry or whoever you'd like to share a model with, they always have a conservation about, you know, we know that the, the model is capable of that accuracy, but I don't know why I'm getting that accuracy. I'm, I'm nervous that if I apply it in different data, I may not get, you know, the same accuracy. And that's a legitimate question. We, we have to have kind of transparent uh, model. And the reason for industry, because they have legal issue, ethical issue, uh, adoption uh, issues, that they have to take it in consideration. Another thing is uh, the, the security of AI itself, because it's very simple that you can actually be biased to your uh, training data. You can uh, poison it easy. Transparency, as we mentioned, is another issue. And that raise questions when these models are actually presented uh, to be used by industry and, and, and government offices uh, uh, and others. So another thing, as I mentioned earlier, machine learning models, uh, reliability and accuracy is still questionable in some uh, fields. So we are masking now the AI predictive analytics side. We have uh, issues to address here before we move to the, the business uh, intelligence issues. And the business intelligence, uh, frankly, I can 
I can name uh, two important uh, issues. First of all, business people are flooded with, with data. You know, no, and not only business, when I say business, that could be people uh, in healthcare or whatever. Um, they're, they're all flooded with data and the complexity of the data is increasing every day. Another thing, what we do for them, we, we get the data, we create our uh, data warehouses, we create nice dashboards for them for decision making. The only problem is, you know, again, you, you provide um, uh, a dashboard and... Um, uh, and, and the expectation here for, for somebody in business is more than a dashboard. Why? Because when you say, okay, as for me, as a data scientist, you told me your problems and I can give you information about this and this and that. I'm, I'm not fu fully aware of what kind of strategic decision you are looking for. And sometimes, even as a business manager or a decision maker or a director, you understand your, your strategy, but you don't understand what kind of support from the data that could actually align with your decision to make it a data-driven decision making. So again, data scientists and managers, they don't speak the same language again. So, and, and as a result of that, the, the um, uh, data scientists, they try to accommodate all kind of what they understand from the strategic decision. And because of that, you run into overhead. Why? Because I need, I need to give you most of the information needed. That's a problem uh, or suitable for your use case. Uh, I need to put a lot of, you know, uh, 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 data governments, uh, what they call uh, aspect to it in order to help you, uh, in order for you to, to, to know who, who will access the data, the security level, privacy, things uh, that you could use in, in, in the decision making. So again, for me, if I'm a manager, I feel that's not enough. And I, I remember we had a meeting uh, with a company that came and, 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 and presented a way of turning uh, the university into data-driven decision-making universities. That's, by the way, it's an initiative that is uh, uh, now taken care of by the uh, big data analytics at the university. The, the issue here is when this company presented, yeah, okay, uh, we take this, we show you these dashboards. Uh, our chancellor uh, was, of course, a, a very knowledgeable person. Straight away, his impression is, uh, 20 years ago, I used to use uh, uh, Excel, and I used to see graphs. I need something that helped me in my decision easier than this. I'd, I, sometimes I don't understand the whole statistical representations. The graph may mean something, but not necessarily align with my decision. Uh, how can I actually interact with that? And that's again a legitimate question that needs to be addressed. So beside that, we uh, now we mask another part of it. But I added another layer here, which is the infrastructure. We, if you are using uh, AI uh, project, if you are using AI techniques today in your project, you realize that we cannot extend the computational resources father and still we run models for days and days so we have a still shortage in computational uh, power that align with with what ai needs you know we are far actually behind uh, what's needed by ai and that's why we don't go farther you know you think again of ensemble modeling you think of deep learning uh, and that requires uh, a lot of uh, computational power so we realized that and we start started to use uh, 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 clouds. But moving to the cloud, we move in different pace. And we start to get the data in the cloud in different ways. And now we ended in, ended in another problem, which is the integration problem of the data. So the data now is, is all over the place in the cloud. And again, we are facing integration problem. Another thing, uh, uh, which is the you know, organization may be restricted by, by some factors. For example, regularity concern, security concern, and uh, severity concern, which is the concern come from the uh, uh, service provider. So the first two here, when I talk about regularity concern and ser uh, security concern, these two is, you know, if you think of, it, of them, they can be addressed. But when we talk about service provided, let's say by Google, then there are a lot of things that beyond our, our control, especially uh, Google has, uh, you know, uh, a country zones. 
and different uh, country have different uh, uh, regulations and, and and different access uh, country zone is the zone by by where you are located and by economical and by political zones and that's why there are few things beyond our our hands to take care of another thing is um, we are masking again the infrastructure now we have other issues which are very important skills you know it's often today we run out in uh, uh, you know uh, in problems uh, uh, such as we don't have enough people to innovate in data analytics and data analytics now become more than just uh, as we mentioned data analytics it's there is uh, ai element in it there is uh, more uh, prescri prescriptive learning out of it we need to uh, uh, the models to be more transparent so we need people understand this model very well so we have two issues first of all there are a lot of people now doing data science you know and i've seen many uh, just go to uh, 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 find a code in python uh, run it you know create a, a notebook uh, run uh, pick a data run some classifier get a result have beautiful uh, visualization and now you're claiming uh, yourself as a data scientist so the, the skills are polluted by many uh, uh, people claiming that they are in the field, but they, they are actually in the surface of, of data science. You need to really understand how the, the, the algorithm work, the math behind it, the theory behind it, before you can be innovative, before you, we can go to the next level. Uh, another thing, we have shortage regardless. So I highlighted here, for example, uh, some cases in 2019, there were a uh, clear shortage in data engineer, and, and, and that happened all the time until, I believe until today, good research, uh, good uh, data engineer and researchers in data science uh, is still a problem. Uh, uh, recently, I'm, I, I, I opened uh, uh, positions in data science, I'm, I'm trying to, to get people to join, and it's really struggle to get good people that you can trust and they can actually advance what you have in your vision for for the for the uh, uh, data analytics in the future. Another thing is um, uh, we often, as I mentioned uh, over and over again, decision makers and, and, and data scientists do not speak the same language, and we need to bridge that gap. Another thing, the process are not automated somehow. You know, you 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 go to Microsoft Azure and. and you have to be a data scientist and you have to understand uh, a lot about how you can build the pipeline. Yes, everything is there, but you have to have that. And I understand the core business for, micro, for Microsoft Azure because they make it for everyone. And especially data scientists, developers, and everyone. So it um, makes sense. But for, for me as a manager or in the future, I don't have to give much you know, attention to that. I just, I have data and I have a decision and I need help in my decision. How can I automate this process? And again, there are companies now working on automating this process and we'll talk about it uh, briefly when I talk about solutions. So two layers now are, are also a uh, mask. So if you look at our architecture now, we have problems all over the place. And if we don't address all these issues, we'll, we will not improve on, on, on the business of AI or, or machine learning or even data science, data science and data analytics. So addressing these issues is no longer a luxury uh, like what we think. And because of uh, thanks, <laughs> the, one of the benefit of, uh, of COVID-19, it, it opened our eyes to this. Now we have to do something about it because you never know tomorrow we can we could face similar problem or uh, different problems that requires uh, the, us to be prepared. The, uh, you know how to deal with lack of data, how to de deal with uh, unstructured data, the data which is not ready, computational resource, all of that. We have to work on solution right now. And, and um, uh, as I mentioned. These are our fundamental requirements for success and it has to be taken care of. And what I will mention here, in order to unlock and, and, and uh, uh, you know, improve uh, this kind of architecture or, or framework or pipeline, we have to look down the road. In the next five years, what should we do? And in the solution I will propose here, there are solutions already started. Uh, there are solutions 
yet to start and there are solutions that require more work uh, in order to be you know uh, effective let's start one if you remember when we talk about uh, data we know sometimes you may not have enough data or you may not have data at all in some problems and that's why we have to turn up our back and look at new techniques that come like I don't know, five or, 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 or uh, years ago, people start to talk about transfer learning, for example. So transfer learning is very powerful and it proved so when uh, in, uh, in the field of uh, computer vision at least. You know, most of us use this might be we are not familiar with the term transfer uh, learning, but we, we did use this if you work on uh, image classification in particular. You know, you don't really create your, your uh, you don't really train uh, a machine learning, uh, uh, you know, uh, model uh, based on a data you collected in order to do some classification. We don't do that no more because they are pre-trained models already in millions of images that I could utilize. So, for example, if you'd like to see uh, a patient has a pneumonia or not, I don't have to find uh, 5 million patient and 5 million x-rays in order to train my model, in order to use it. No, I don't have to do that. What I could do is as simple as that. I can use already predefined or pre-trained models. These models look at smaller pixel and smaller patterns that could work in my novel cases and it could be utilized and everybody's using them now but it's about time to move to more than just computer vision more than image uh, processing so this is another way i don't have the data uh, with respect to covid 19 but i have similar data that we actually uh, uh, collected and analyzed for ebola for example and i could see what are the uh, similarities that i could actually use from the existing model that could help me uh, to do some predictions reinforcements reinforcement learning is another way uh, you don't have to have a data uh, uh, as simple as that for example uh, if you you have an agent uh, in certain environment would like to move from point to point, then we don't have to have a data on how the directions will look like or what's the optimal uh, ways. If I have that kind of data, I have no problem. I can straight away use supervised learning. But the problem is reinforcement learning is not supervised learning, it's not unsupervised learning, it's something else because the data doesn't exist. To move from uh, point A to point B, let's picture it as a, a child would like to learn how to walk from certain point to another point. So when you start walking, you can just, you know, give a, 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 you know, a, a reward. If the child, for example, move forward, uh, you can uh, straight away highlight problems when the child fall off. That's again is moving forward. And the child will keep doing this until learn how to walk. That's exactly what we do. And you could see a lot of application already started to exist now, when, uh, especially if you work on, on, uh, on uh, mobility, uh, people work on, on, on drones, uh, straight away they want to find the optimal uh, movement from, from point to point and, 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 and stop points. Uh, makes sense to have reinforcement uh, learning. And uh, then uh, also GAN come in the picture. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, everyone is familiar with GAN. That was, it's, it's, it's uh, published something like six years ago, but it start to flourish now because you have uh, two neural networks. And in case you, you have limited data, you can use this data in order to have a neural network to come up with certain samples or, or, or attributes or uh, Let's back again to our uh, pneumonia uh, uh, x-rays. You know, simply, you could, the neural network, look at what you have as samples and try to replicate that and come up with, another, with more samples that increase the number of, of, of samples to enhance more the, the accuracy of your training model. Um, we ourselves, we tried that in a in, in, in few applications and it worked uh, nicely. So um, not only that, not necessary uh, for for a problem like this but if you would like to um, uh, you you want to hear my presentation in native english for example i'm sure that would be uh, preferable to everyone so we could use gan to you know to extract what i say and improve it to the level that could be 
uh, you know, uh, meaningful and, and understandable by you. So there are a lot of application and the sky is the uh, limit for, for all these uh, three uh, new techniques. So um, as I mentioned, we talk about data, model, process, and we said process now becoming important. That's why we're getting back again to the data and, and, and imposing some processes that from now on, how the data would be shared. We don't have to wait for the last minute until a uh, crisis hit. And then we look at the data. Okay, can we use that data? And then we start the process of approvals and, and ethical, uh, you know, uh, approvals, legal issues and uh, privacy and all that kind of. It has to be done uh, uh, early on when the data is coming in at the same time. So what I'm expecting in the next five years, you will find data uh, marketplace. You've seen We've seen marketplace of everything. You will find data, especially when this process are really uh, become uh, recognizable and usable. Straight away, uh, companies, big companies, will find them either buying or selling uh, data in 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 in, uh, uh, in marketplaces. That for sure will be the case in five years' uh, time. So it will be a way of generating uh, more uh, revenue and it could be a way of even sharing uh, data that uh, they can get inside of their data. So we are unlock now uh, the data sources because we have techniques that could actually handle this, but it has to be put in uh, full potential. So uh, in terms of AI, again, um, I, I mentioned a uh, few uh, techniques here and they are all uh, also usable to improve our AI predictive modeling in general. So um, uh, ensemble modeling, uh, ensemble learning, it's, uh, uh, it's been used and proved to be uh, really, uh, you know, uh, robust and, and, and accurate. Uh, reinforcement learning, we have already discussed it on transfer, uh, transfer uh, learning. But I'm also uh, here, I'm stressing on continuous learning and federated learning. These are all directions that uh, people in machine learning and data analytics are exploring at the moment. Continuous learning, of course, started a long time back, but we have not hit the, the success that we are looking for. Because if you want to do continuous learning, and if you have streaming data or live data coming in, you need an instant uh, decision, and you need at the same time your model to learn from the data coming in to do that continuous learning, we have uh, is still a problem uh, 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 to be uh, solved here because we are, we are not to the, in the limit uh, that our data is learning in that beautiful way, the same way we learn every day uh, new things. Federated learning uh, is another uh, good way of solving the problem of data access. For example, uh, uh, we just mentioned hospitals having data, let's say when COVID-19 uh, started and we tried to get data in order uh, for us to help. Um, and I've seen papers published in, in big and highly reputable journal. Uh, the significance what? Because they have the data. It's very basic statistics, but the contribution is we have the data, we can show you something out of it. So, um, how we so outcome how we, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, solve that problems. And that could be in one way. Leave the data as it is in uh, where it's uh, it's located. What we could do, we can cr create a model here, uh, a learning model that we think is appropriate, and I can send you the model to be run in your uh, data without me looking at your data. What I could uh, look at the feedback from the, uh, you, the the model, because if I send the same model or a copy of the model to multiple distributed uh, systems, then I start to get the feedback, then I integrate it in my model to enhance it more. Because as I mentioned, the more data you have, the more you can come up with solid uh, model to be trained. So it's, it's, it's a win-win situation. I'm not touching your data, but I'm getting exactly what I'm supposed to do. Traditionally, we bring this data uh, in our data leg, dump everything, uh, clean it, and then start to develop models, and then start to improve that performance and, 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 and all. So now, think of it this way. I just need uh, uh, what they call uh, the, the feedback from the, uh, uh, the model. That's also help in distributing the workload because now the training level that done instead of doing, you know, 
gigabytes of, of training data. It could be distributed elsewhere. Um, companies started to look at this uh, and uh, they want to leverage data in, mob in our mobile phones, in, in other uh, devices, that uh, uh, it could be uh, also helpful. So if we follow this path, I think uh, we'll be in a good shape for AI predictive uh, uh, modeling uh, side. So we unlock that side. For business intelligence, I think from the problem, uh, it was clear that, as I mentioned, dashboards are not enough uh, for us today. So we need automated solutions. I, I'm, as a manager, you know, I want to know everything related to my decision without me, without even knowledge in the machine learning or data science or anything like that. You you find now the most successful managers are the managers coming, especially in business, from the management information system who understand the structure of the data, who understand the predictive and, and uh, modeling and, and all kind of modeling. At least they could be, you know, uh, they have that flexibility to dig in, in the data and understand it. So what we need here is, but as the data is getting more and more and the decisions are becoming more complicated nowadays, we need more than that. And not only that, we're talking about new branches now of AI coming up. So even if I'm doing uh, uh, MIS, I'm not necessarily aware of how this kind of algorithm work. And that's why we need to come up with another solution. And that's why nowadays everyone, uh, especially in uh, data uh, analytics, are talking about augmented analytics. A biomented analytics is, put it this way, um, I, I just want to type question and I get answers straight away from my data. So here we are leveraging machine learning and, and natural language processing. So we are, we are uh, uh, taking language translated into something that understandable by the machine and uh, by the machine learning models and then I can get that, you know, the maximum out of this kind of merge between these two disciplines. I'll give you an example. Uh, um, for ex let's say, well, let's think of very complicated uh, scenario of decision making. Um, let's say uh, um, uh, back to, uh, to academia and you want to see a uh, student at risk and you are the vice chancellor of the university. You may not be really, uh, uh, you know, from, from a computational uh, background and you want to just want to see what's happening here, I can ask questions. Why the student are delayed? Why, for example, a student uh, at risk? Why that particular student did not graduate on time? And I should be able to get that answers. And by the way, uh, sounds like magic, but it's not because this effort have already started. If you look at uh, Power BI, the latest um, you know, improvement last year, they added that feature. It's still, it's not working uh, to the, uh, uh, to the expectation that we're looking for, but you can still type your data and you can still get insights. Um, and they add it in, in very beautiful ways, just like a widget that you can actually straight away add it to your data and start asking questions. Uh, why, um, for example, who's the top students or uh, how many cases I'm gonna get next year of COVID-19, things like this, and straight away get an answer. Uh, in terms of um, infrastructure, um, I'm not a computer engineer, but obviously we need uh, uh, new uh, chip architectures. We need, um, uh, you know, to accommodate our uh, computational needs. And I know there are efforts now to 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 put a brain in the chip in order to, uh, you know, accelerate the, uh, uh, you know, how I was doing this, accelerate the uh, uh, the processing level, but. It's still my feeling we, we need a breakthrough in this and it's still missing no matter what we're, we're doing today. I'm expecting in the next five years we may not reach that limit, but at least there will be also some steps in quantum computing. And we know in quantum computing everything will change and unless we reach that level and the promises by quantum computing, I think we'll still uh, be struggling with with uh, 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 with the expectation and the hype and the promises the AI giving us. Cloud computing is must. I think we realized that we started to work on it, and uh, uh, we have to do more of of uh, cloud uh, uh, computing. 
So infrastructure is also, uh, uh, as you could see here, is unlocked. Uh, in terms of um, automation, I think we have to go for automated, um, uh, intelligent, and explainable data-driven decision making. So it's no longer data-driven decision making. Uh, the the the, uh, the traditional way we look at it, it has to be automated all over, and it has to be intelligent, and it has to help really in decision making. So, when we say intelligent, that things like augmented analytics should be engaged. Uh, things like uh, uh, when we say automated, um, even for uh, data scientists, they have to worry about the you know improving the algorithm not just the by the pipeline and that's why there are company also coming now and their core business is to make this process automated and you can see uh, many of them coming up now they are not to the uh, limit that we expected again you still have to you know be engaged somehow they they still ask you questions show you something to get your feedback uh, in the in the pipeline but they're you know, they are built platform capable of cleaning the data uh, automatically, uh, uh, select features automatically, select the right uh, uh, model uh, automatically, although it's kind of slow because you run a bunch of models to, to gag, the, uh, to gag the, um, uh, the performance and find the best uh, accuracy provided by which algorithm and then uh, uh, use that algorithm in the pipeline without you interfering in the process. But the only thing, again, I have to run everything. Uh, I have to wait until this model are trained and, and that take really significant time. And, and, and also I'm not getting the, um, uh, uh, the transparency that I'm looking for. Yes, you could see the pipeline, but we are, lo we are looking at more than that. I would like to give feedback. Uh, I would like to say why the accuracy is 90%. Well, I would like to say why that student in risk straight away without digging in. So in terms of skills, um, uh, we, we can always uh, come up with intensive training, putting in our mind the latest technology and, and, and do some uh, certifications because we, we have to go for quick wins here. We have to identify good data scientists and go to the next level. So if you look at um, now, uh, the, the architecture we saw uh, half an hour ago, if we put all these solutions and inject it in, we can have better uh, um, uh, you know, solution for the next five years. We can start to solve a lot of major issues, but to do this, there's a lot of work to be done. So let me uh, summarize my uh, directions here uh, and recommendations in eight important points. First of all, in order to go to the next level of, uh, of data analytics, first of all, stories has to be automated. We have to use things like augmented analytics uh, techniques to give managers and decision making uh, the, the, the flexibility to ask questions. The question they ask us and we go back and dig in, in, in the data, it has to be automated. They have to ask questions and get the instance uh, answers straight. So also we'll, we have to see a rise of, as I mentioned, automated, intelligent and explainable data-driven decision making. So I added these three keywords, and we, we should no longer say data-driven decision-making. We should say automated, intelligent, and explainable uh, data-driven decision-making. Then it makes sense for industry. Then they can buy our ideas. They can use our solutions, and they can benefit, and we can also, again, benefit as well. So there will be also more focus on X analytics. I'm using the terms X analytics uh, uh, that coined by, by Gartner. Um, X here for any kind of data. It could be audio, uh, you know, it could be emotion, sentiment, or flat data, or, or social media, data, any kind of data. We have to find a way, as I mentioned, to make this data available. And as I mentioned, soon this data will be available in marketplaces. Now we know that there are some uh, uh, companies are selling data, but in, not in a way uh, that we are envisioning that you go, anybody can go and buy whatever because the data is already clean, the privacy and security and all kind of uh, uh, ethical uh, level of approvals and, 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 and process taken care of. Uh, there is authorization uh, uh, to sell the data and uh, uh, we, we can utilize uh, the cloud to do so. 
Uh, as I mentioned, big organization will be involved very soon in, in, in doing this. Uh, the second point, number four, is related to number three, which is uh, the organization of uh, using blockchain, for example, a smart contract for creating. We understand that blockchain may create more clean data, less data, because we can eliminate a lot of redundancy and, and privacy and, 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 and ethical uh, and, and security levels, but we have clean data. But it could enhance point number three. The marketplace requires, as I mentioned, that kind of you know privacy level to be taken care of, security level, and blockchain could take care of that. So we'll see the merge between cloud computing, blockchain, and marketplaces for, for data come hand to hand in the future. Cloud is a must. I don't think I have to convince you any more about this uh, uh, because it, it offers some cost optimization. And, uh, and if we approach it with the right mindset, I think it will be very helpful. Data architecture is no longer uh, the way we uh, uh, we look at it before uh, what we go, you know, for any company, what do you do? Just ask for any problem, you come up and they come up and show you this, the same architecture again because that's the generic architecture and, and, and need to be customized here and there. We have to, you know, the, the data architecture decision requires some level of, uh, of discipline. And, and, and why? Because we need to establish viable options uh, for, for our clients. So it has to be uh, put in a way that we're taking care of the implementation issues, the deployment issues, and the cost of, of doing all that. So it has to come up in a way that has that kind of discipline, that it make more sense. There is a very important item here, which is the graph technologies. Um, you know, um, I've been using uh, graph theory for, for quite some time. And let me tell you, it's really powerful, especially if you are dealing with, with a data and you reach a limit with your machine learning uh, techniques to do some predictions. Graph technology or, or, or graph theory or, or um, a graph structure could capture things beyond what you are looking for. Because if you take your data and also... Uh, uh, if it's possible to uh, construct a graph out of it, let's say it's a social media data, it's easy to find that kind of uh, relationship between uh, people or marketing data. Customers could be node, uh, and you can link them by, by whatever relationship you see it variable. Then you start to capture things like, you know, uh, topological features of the graph. Who's the most influential person uh, or, or, uh, or item? Uh, what that link means? How, how can we add different, you know, way to that link and end up with different relationship between attributes? You find more valuable information coming in. And, and, and I think that would be very helpful when you do machine learning work. And not only that, even uh, people working on graph now, they, they, they started to go to the next level. They started to do convolutional graph technologies to, to look deeper on, on the graph relationships. So by doing this, you add more value to the already attributes that you have. You add more, uh, you could say, uh, valuable features that could enhance your solution further. And again, acceleration of uh, quantum computing I cannot say that getting computing, uh, quantum computing ready, but acceleration in the uh, quantum computing research. And I know there are a lot of companies now are working hard to accelerate that, not only companies, but universities. And in my university now, we're, we're taking even quantum computing uh, seriously we know uh, it takes an effort between uh, people working on science and physics and mathematics and, and people in computing it's a it's a multidisciplinary uh, field that everybody has to uh, to contribute in order for us to solve the computational problem forever and move to the next era so with this I end up my presentation I would like to thank you so please let me know if you have any questions Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, really a uh, very interesting lecture. And uh, I appreciate Prof already give us uh, the idea what is the issue that we should look at it and what is the recommendation for the next five years. Uh, I will have one question, especially because uh, Prof did mention about the issue uh, occur in terms of the data, the model, the infrastructure, 
the issue from the dashboard as well as the issue on the skill. But my question is regarding on the data, uh, based on prof uh, experience, uh, what do you think um, about the importance of social media data in these uh, the next five years in data analytics? Well, um, that's a good question because uh, social media data become very important and we mm. know that because, uh, you know, now anything we do, uh, any information you would like to know, you get it from the social uh, media data. And that's why there is extensive research in, in, uh, in, in uh, extracting relevant information from social media data and become very important source. It's still, um, uh, if you think of it from from research point of view, we still have a problem on on how we get this data in, in a way that we can apply our learning system. Because most of this data is uh, unstructured data. Uh, think of uh, Twitter, for example. There are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, text and challenges and, and uh, linguistic problems and natural language processing problems that need to be addressed. But given that, you know, uh, issue, it's very important resources and uh, it's pretty much is in the business. That's why I add it as one of the item in my data sources. It's very important uh, to take it in consideration. It's very important to get view of of you know you know other completely uh, independent source of data. Uh, now, even talking about COVID nineteen, you would like to know the view of people. The only way you can get that view is through social media. Okay, I see. Uh, okay, uh, let's see the question from the audience we have one question from uh, dr ernie uh, is it nlp that power bi using for query yes so, so um, yeah uh, actually i was excited to uh, to see that um, uh, features added to power bi I, I believe that was last year uh, end of last year so um, it's very helpful because they understood the uh, the importance of uh, augmented um, uh, you know analytics, and I'm sure they got that because of feedback from companies, managers. Uh, we need that. We need to ask our own questions and get the answer right away uh, uh, for efficiency of decision making. You know, some of the decision they cannot afford to have meetings and get back and and find the. There are decision makers, there are committees, and they data scientists. So in order to go, get back again, why this and why that, that may take uh, forever. Not only that, you may not get the right answers. And, and sometimes I just need to understand things and I need to type it. So if you uh, use Power BI, I think it's, it's, it's free. Uh, you can straight away uh, uh, add that kind of uh, feature, asking questions about your data and you can see right answers. You will notice that it's, uh, it's helpful, uh, but it's limited if you use it that way. It will be more helpful if you are using uh, Microsoft Azure at the same time. So if you're, as you may kindly mentioned, using social media data, for example, and store it somewhere in your data uh, uh, lake there in Microsoft Azure, you will have better question and answers because you can utilize a huge amount of text uh, already cleaned and be ready to be mined. Because remember, it's a merge between uh, the uh, uh, natural language processing and machine learning. You are basically asking machine learning techniques questions, but machine learning, <laughs> unfortunately, they don't understand what we say. There should be some way of communication, and, and natural language processing does that. Okay, thank you, Prof. I think uh, uh, what Prof has shared to us is really very helpful for us in order to see what is the direction, especially for our audience those who are in their studies and also uh, doing their PhDs as well, and also even those who are planning for the postgraduates and stuff, because uh, it is very eye-opening and we can have uh, opinions from uh, the experts. And uh, really thanks. Uh, before that, uh, do we have any others? Please, uh, if you have any question, you can uh, post in the Facebook and we will address uh, by Prof. Nazar later on. So if let's say if you have any questions yes, after I'll that, we can email to Prof. Nazar. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, can, thanks, uh, Professor Zaki. Or... Yeah, yes. yes. Okay. So thanks, Professor Zaki, for a very insightful lecture. 
So I hope all the viewers can benefit from this knowledge sharing and we hope we will have much more after this. And I now will pass back to our faculty dean for the closure remark. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Chang Wen Ho, for moderating the session. And thank you for introducing Professor Nazar Zaki to me. And to our distinguished speaker, Professor Nazar Zaki, thank you for accepting our invitation. And uh, thank you for a great sharing session. And uh, I guess I miss you because uh, you graduated from UTM in 2004. Am I right? 2004. Yes. 2004. Because, uh, because I joined yes. UTM after my PhD in 2005. So just miss one year. All right. Because <laughs> it seems like we receive a, a lot of uh, welcoming home uh, message to you from uh, our seniors, from our senior lecturers, from our professors right. to you. So it seems like you are a very popular person it's here in UTM. Pleasure. <laughs> so, it's always again, a pleasure you know to reconnect it's always a pleasure and we're looking forward for more collaboration with the big data analytics center here at the university i'm sure we have a lot to do in common and i would like to thank you very much for for the opportunity and for reconnecting with you and because you know uh, we have a lot we have to pay back to utm for all we got from so um, thank you very much again Okay, thank you uh, to all of our viewers around the globe. Thank you for watching UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye-bye for now and assalamu alaikum. Okay, thank you bye. very much.